what is cracking healthiest social media family in the game. It's your boy K Shines, rocking those DJ Dwayne Rock Johnson headphones, the uh, Project Rock One shoes from the Veterans Day collection. Here's the deal, I'm a crusader. I went to Archbishop Reardon High School. This is our weight room. This was my Mecca, this was my home, this was my house. Worked out here every day, learned how to do muscle ups like a badass piece 40 in one session. Now, here's what I wanna say about Archbishop Reardon High School. It's a beautiful school for, for young men. It's an all boys school, Catholic school. You learn about faith, tradition, integrity, hope, and I learned how to be a better man here at Archbishop Reardon High School from Juan Zamato Jr., Mr. Vittorio Anastasio. The, Juan is the Dean of Students and Mr. Anastasio was the principal. I learned how to be a man, how to be strong and stand tall, and how to never let anybody take me down. Life is a gift, cherish it always, and be here tomorrow. Let's actually start with, uh, let's talk about Harold and Alex. Oh yeah, two of my favorites. So the people who coached the longest at Reardon be like myself, I did like 30 seasons. Um, and then we come, Harold did 13 seasons, and then Alex did 10 seasons, and JC has done like 15 seasons. So between the four of us, you know, we're the long, longest uh, longevity coaches in that program. Probably the whole of San Francisco, right? Yeah, probably. And, uh, you know, I don't know. Some of the public school coaches did it for a while, but. Uh, we're definitely the, the most successful and you know is to have somebody like uh alex who was a, an olympic referee and a, and a national team member in the old soviet union uh helping out kids in the mat room was was amazing is yeah. alex still with us no he passed away oh, about uh, two years ago i think can, and you, can you give me a rundown of uh, like basically what you know of the history of alex's life because that would be powerful you know, we had a language barrier with Alex. So what was funny was in, uh, it was like in 1995, we were hosting a, a Russian team. So I called up SF State. They had a new assistant coach, Igor Shirba, who was uh, helping out. So I go, hey, I, he was on the national team for the Soviets too. And I said, hey, I got a team coming in. He goes, oh, I'll help you. And there's a referee who just moved into the city. We'll get him the referee. I go, oh, great. And he goes, yeah, he speaks English too. I go, really? And he's like, yeah, great. So we, we meet Alex, Alex, poor Alex. He didn't speak any English. He could understand a little bit, but he, all he said was two words, no problem. You know, he, he said, totally did. He no always problem. said that, no problem, no problem. <laughs> no problem, no problem. You know, and, uh, and so we had him help us referee. I was a, the president of, of the Barrier Wrestling Association at the time. We're always short on referees. And I said, hey, you want to help us referee at the local tournaments? No He's like, problem. no problem, no problem. So I just go pick him up all the time. And and so he was in the car with me and I would have my wrestlers in the car too. And the wrestlers really liked him because he was tough. And and even though he didn't speak English, there was you know that language barrier. But through wrestling, you just learn how to compete, you know, how communicate. to can communicate the the, re the language of wrestling is international. Well, he would so, move his arms. He would show you the move. Exactly. He would show you exactly what to do. When you did it wrong, he would go like this. Yeah. He would tap you. And so, you know, assistant coaches, they come and go. And I remember we were driving in the car and I just found out one of my assistant coaches got a job with the sheriff's department or something like that. And I told the kids, I go, bummer, we lost this coach. I go, now I gotta try to scramble to find another coach. I mean, who's free at three o'clock in the day, every day and all day on Saturdays, you know, to to make basically no money. And uh, <laughs> so uh, they go, why don't you ask Coach Alex? And I, so I asked him, he said, no problem. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> so he coached at our school for 10 years and then he, um, started having some health issues and he just started focusing more just on referees he was refereeing all the all the national tournaments for the u.s he got really involved with california usa wrestling and everybody just loved him everybody would drive him around and, uh, my favorite alex story though is uh we went to his house one night for dinner and we're there we're, we're having the russian food and at our table we had Alexander Medved, who was at the time in the Guinness Book of World Records for the most wrestling titles in, in the world. And we had uh, Uregan, 
who was the head Soviet wrestling coach who won more world titles than any coach. And we had uh, the Bela Glazov twins were there, which were between the two of them, you know, they're probably the two most successful wrestling brothers in the world. And it was me and Igor and a couple other high level, like amazing, you know, so I'm sitting here, this would be like the equivalent of having dinner with, uh, you know, Magic Johnson, uh, Michael Jordan, Larry Bird. And The Rock. You know, and The Rock, yeah. I, I mean, this was like the royalty of wrestling and I'm sitting there at his house and the Russian way to do things is you, uh, everybody fills up their glasses and takes a shot of, uh, stands up, makes a speech, and then everybody takes a shot of whiskey. <laughs> I mean, not whiskey, vodka. And uh, and so I was the last guy. They went around, I think there was 11 or 12 of them. <laughs> and I'm the last guy doing the speech. By that, by the time we got to that point, I think I was talking Russian. I don't know, it was, uh, but you know, we all crashed at his house that night. And we were just talking wrestling, even though there was that language barrier, we were laughing and and having a great time. And, and that's how connected he was with the sport. And what was his last name? Ostrovsky. Alec, Alex Ostrovsky. Ostrovsky, O-S-T-R-O-V-I-S-K-Y. Did he ever learn any other words, but no problem? Yeah, you know, he did. And um, his English did improve, you know, over the years working with us. He learned, uh, he even learned some of the San Francisco slang and, you know, uh, the what, would he, what would he say? What would he say in English? You know, like no capping. What we say that as, uh, you know, don't make fun of people at practice or yeah. anything like no capping, you know, and, uh, but yeah, his English, you know, became better. And, and then later on in life when, you know, when I was connecting with him, it seemed to have gone kind of backwards as he, yeah. as he was dealing with health issues. And how, stuff how did like he that. pass? Uh, I don't know the exact cause, but I do know, you know, he was like, he had a heart attack at a wrestling tournament and he was back on the mat a week and a half later. Whoa. And I mean, he just loved wrestling. If he could pick a place to die, it would be on the mat. And, you know, one time him and I, we had this one conversation, um, and we were in the car, you know, we do these long road trips, 11 hours from here to San Diego or you know, in, in the van and, and, uh, he started talking to us about his, his, uh, life in the Soviet union. You know, he was Jewish and the Nazis were coming after him and most of his family got wiped out in world war two. And he saw some tragic stuff where he did not speak a word until he was eight years old from the stuff he saw. He was in trucks with military. He was just a little boy, just living and seeing all this chaos. And, you know, he weathered all of that and really one of the most humble, beautiful people I have ever met in my life. Just a, a sweetheart of a person. And wrestling was what got him to start speaking. He joined a, a program. Uh, back then, they they wrestled outdoors. They would throw sand over a lawn, and that was their wrestling mat. And there's some pictures of him. I got to show you. He looked like Bruce Lee. He was chiseled. He was tough. And and then he um, he ended up, you know, climbing the ranks of wrestling to the point where he was a referee in the 1980 Olympics in Moscow. So that was kind of the pinnacle of his career. But then in the US, uh, a few years before he passed, he received the official of the year uh, in the US and they recognized him in front of thousands over in uh, Fargo. So yeah, he actually lived right by here too. He lived in a, a senior home over here in the Tenderloin, which is a pretty rough neighborhood. That's uh, where I was born. Oh, you were born in the TL? I was, I was born in the crack house in the Tim, in Tim Yeah. Born, yeah. It's born in squalor. Yeah. It's still tough out there, man. It's, it's, it's the worst neighborhood then, worst neighborhood there today. Yeah, yeah. In San Francisco. How, how old was he when he passed? Uh, you know? I think about it, probably around 80. He sure know? lived a hell of a full life. Yeah, you know, especially with people in his generation, the life, life expectancy of a, of a Russian male was like 52 years old. 
So for him, he was very old, you know, 